Hey everybody, uh, first of all, I'm going to start with a correction. In the last podcast, I heavily implied that crazy independent movies were the only true American art form, and this is, of course, incorrect. There's also jazz and stand-up comedy and a bunch of other stuff that is also clearly uh, truly American art forms. Because I was thinking about it the other day and I said to myself, that wasn't true. Anyway, speaking of crazy, independent, uniquely American stuff, the third series of Twin Peaks ended a few weeks ago, but I only saw the last two episodes the other night. The last two episodes, 17 and 18, were broadcast at the same time, as far as I know. And I only saw them the other night. It's mental, right? Yeah. Mad! Uh, it's really weird if you come from something like uh, literally any other television series and then say, yeah, alright, let's have a look at Twin Peaks. It does twist your brain. This last series uh, was a lot less like the uh, the TV show we all know and love and a lot more like the, the weird movies David Lynch has been making since then, like, uh, like Mulholland Drive and Inland Empire. If you've ever seen those, they're much closer in tone and content and theme and I guess even camera angle to the new series than the last two, which were... David Lynch was under a lot of studio pressure the last time he made this show and this series he was under no studio pressure whatsoever he could do whatever the hell he wanted and he did uh, loads of people watch these things you know these Twin Peaks things Twin Peaks things and his his latest movies and they have the same reaction you know what the hell is happening this is pretentious art school wank and so on it's like who's he what's going on where is he this doesn't make any sense and so on now I get all that I do. I do actually get all that. In the sense that I understand why somebody would have that opinion. But I'm going to uh, attempt to mount a defense of Twin Peaks The Return. He called it The Return. No, he didn't call it Season 3. He called it The Return. Twin Peaks The Return, specifically for people who think it's pretentious art house wank, on the assumption that this is their genuine opinion, a genuine opinion, and not just a dismissal based on, you know, not giving a shit. And I've already expressed this in a Facebook post of a friend of mine who said it was pretentious art school wank. Uh, an opinion which I understand, by the way. I'm not trying to say it's a completely ludicrous opinion. I mean, you can look at anything David Lynch makes and say it's pretentious art school wank, and you're not going to be too far off the truth. <laughs> you know? Okay, not going to lie. But I love it. <laughs> Maybe I like pretentious art school wank. I don't know. Maybe that's my problem. There's no... I mean, there's no... There's, uh, when you think something is pretentious art school wank, or just pretentious in general... There is no way to defend it that's not going to come across as pretentious itself. There just isn't any way. If you, whatever it is, if you think Coca-Cola is pretentious, there'd be no way for me to defend Coca-Cola that, that would not come across to you as pretentious. So there's no way. I didn't bother trying, in other words. I'm just going to launch right into it. The David Lynch thing is postmodernism and modern art. It's a part of the modern art thing that we got new, uh, 20th century phenomenon do, 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 do. it's modern art um, David Lynch has carved himself a niche inside this modern art thing this American modern art thing for himself it's brilliantly creative and original and even if you don't like it that in itself has to be worth something I firmly believe that like, there's stuff I am aware of that I've seen that I can't handle at all that I just can't stand it but I get it that it's creative and original, and from that point of view, it's valuable. Not to me, but it's valuable to the world, in a sense. Anything that's creative and original. Right? That's an opinion. Modern art is new. Modern art is new. How can you identify modern art and modernism and postmodernism and so on? Well, for the first time under modernism we had paintings and other artworks that weren't really about anything like that's the first question you're going to ask isn't it what's that about the history of art can be seen as waves of of uh, stuff waves of different styles but broadly if you want to put a really broad thing on it it goes from iconic to representational to non-representational but not iconic either iconic would mean 
if if something is like a, a stick man would be like a an iconic thing because it doesn't look anything like a man but you get it like or that's you know the smiley face that they have in Watchmen or the LSD pins they just you know they, you know it looks nothing like a smiley face it's bright yellow and it has three marks on it no nothing in there is telling you it's a face but you still recognize it as a face because it's iconic right so art moved from that kind of cave drawing thing all the way up to representational art which would mean representational means it's supposed to genuinely represent something so at that point it would look like things like you'd have portraits and religious paintings and so on and they're actually supposed to look like what they're what they're represent so it's representational so if you have a photo of Moses on the mountain not a photo a painting if you have a photo of Moses on the mountain oh I want to talk to you we are going to get a Nobel Prize in so they're going to make a new category of Nobel Prize for us and the Nobel Prize for photography goes to Barry Purcell and this person who called him. Actually, you know what? Why don't you just go and do it yourself? Why are you involving me in it? Why does everything have to revolve around me? Why do I have to do everything? So if you have a painting of Moses on the Mount, at that stage of the art history thing, it's going to look like it. You won't have to work out any of the details, you know. Um, and now, in modern art, we have a new thing, which is not representational, but also not iconic. So you have something like Salvador Dali's Melton Watches, or what is it called? Persistence of Memory, I think it's called. And that's not really... It's definitely not iconic. And it's not really representational, in that you can kind of recognise bits of the what he might have meant to paint, but he clearly is screwing it up on purpose for some reason. And that's modern art. But for iconic and representational art, saying something like, what does this mean, is a perfectly reasonable question. You know? So if you see the p cave paintings that ancient, ancient people drew on walls in France, you could you can say, what does that mean? And that's not a bad question. I mean, we might never know, but the question itself makes sense. Does it mean a religious thing, or does it mean he was just bored and painted some animals? You know, that's a fine question for uh, iconic art and representational art. Representational art, what does it mean, is very obvious, usually. So you have a painting of Henry VIII, and you say, what does this mean? Uh, means Henry VIII painted, uh, paid a guy to paint him. Right? That's fair enough. What does this mean is a completely reasonable question there. But for a lot of modern art, saying what does this mean is incoherent. It doesn't really... It's not a sensible question for a lot of it. Which is why any attempts to answer that question will also appear coher uh, incoherent. They might not make sense. So you see a modern art and it's just a load of colours and a few splashes here and you ask me what does it mean? I mean that's not a sensible question to me. And you ask, even if you ask the artist, you'd be like, well, I don't know. He's not going to know. That's not, that's not what it's for. You're asking the wrong question. The correct question is not, what does this represent, but what do I represent? See, this is the bit where it comes across as sounding pretentious. Nothing I can do about it. I did, I did warn you. The ultimate explanation of lots of modern art d does not even lie with the artist, but any artist who tries to explain this comes off like it's a lazy cop-out, you know? But it's not. It's the fundamental reality of modern art is, what does this mean to you? Not, what does this mean full stop? Remember, we live in a world where some people never ask themselves this question. They never ask questions of themselves, wh wh what they feel about things or what they think about things. They just roll along their lives thinking things and feeling things. But they never ask the question, why do I feel like this? What am I feeling? And why? Those are important questions. They're not wanky questions. They're really important. They can mean the difference between a... They can mean the difference between living a happy life and just rolling along in semi-aware depression and never known why why did everything go wrong for me why this? never mind that why do you think the way you do see that's what modern art is for not what does this represent but what do I represent the existential approach to reality is, is you create your own meaning every minute of every day so why not when you're looking at paintings why not when you're watching television particularly if that's explicitly what it's for Bob Dylan used to get asked this question over and over again in, in the famous 1960s press conferences. He'd say, what does this song mean? What does that song mean? There's no way to answer it that isn't also going to be the opposite of an answer. So, you know, he started off trying to tell people, well, this is about this and this is about that. And then he went on to saying, telling the truth, which is, I don't know. Now, the press didn't like that, of course. Nobody did. Now, everybody who wasn't an artist didn't even understand that answer. Because he wrote the song. How could he not know what it means? 
But he, he did say it. He said, I don't know what it means. I just write the songs. If you like them, then we're good. And the people who know what I'm doing will understand, like open-minded, artistic kind of people. They'll understand. And they don't need it explained to them. If you do need it explained to you, then anything I can tell you will be the opposite of an explanation. It's like what Wittgenstein said about uh, everything. He said about reality. He said that which, uh, that whereof we cannot speak, thereof we must remain silent. Which has been misinterpreted by everybody, but that's what he meant. He meant if you can't talk about something, there's no point in talking about it. Just take it literally. When Wittgenstein says something, normally you can just take it literally. And he didn't mean that, that they're worthless. He just meant there's no point in talking about them. Things like art and music and literature and so on. He felt so strongly about those things and his, his feelings about them were so uh, instinctual rather than analytic that he felt like you couldn't explain it to someone. You can't explain something that's intuitive in analytic terms. It comes across as extraordinarily pretentious. Huh. And eventually Bob Dylan, if you can see these on YouTube, the San Francisco press conferences where he answered every question with just random gibberish because to him the questions, and anybody who's paying attention by the way, those questions are random gibberish. They just sound like real questions. What does this mean? Sounds like a real question. But it's gibberish in the case of a lot of Bob Dylan stuff, and it's certainly gibberish in in in, in terms of David Lynch stuff. There's um. There's footage, on YouTube of David Lynch sometimes trying to explain his stuff, but usually he doesn't bother. But sometimes he tries. But again, there's no way to do it. There won't be the opposite of an explanation. In one clip, he, there's a high school teacher. Um. Who asked him to explain? She said she showed Mulholland Drive to her English class in high school and she asked him to explain the themes and the imagery and so on. And of course everybody in the audience laughs at that point because they're all there at a David Lynch press conference and what's he supposed to do? He can't explain the imagery any more than you can. So he just says, he tries, he says, he tries to explain it, he says, it's a ser the, f the phrase he uses is, br is great, it's a series of abstractions, right? That's when he calls Mulholland Drive, and that's pretty much what the new Twin Peaks show is as well. It's a series of abstractions. Like, none of it is designed to be taken entirely literally, or entirely what you see. Like, normally a show will... You take something like Game of Thrones. What you have is a storyline, and you have people acting out bits of the storyline, and then all the abstractions are laid on top of that. Right? But the actual story itself, you can take that more or less literally. So when Bobby Snow goes to Castle Grayskull and he has the army of darkness behind him, you're unless somebody wakes up in a fever immediately afterwards, you can reasonably assume that Bobby Snow has gone to the Castle Grayskull with the army of darkness behind him. I don't watch Game of Thrones, you can probably tell. But that's I know there's a character called Bobby Snow or, and there definitely is a Castle Grayskull. Or something like that and there's definitely an army of darkness and I don't know what you guys call it but it's definitely an army of darkness but you can take all that more or less literally and then afterwards you can say oh, well this represents this and this represents that but in the David Lynch stuff he just gets rid of all the first bit and goes straight into the abstractions all the stuff you normally overlay on a story with your own sense of meaning what you take out of it and, th and the themes of friendship and what it means to be a good person and so on all the stuff you're laying that on top of in every other show, that's gone in Twin Peaks. There is stuff in Twin like, the, the people just appear and disappear on the screen, by the way. They just flash off, they disappear, and then appear somewhere else with no explanation. And it just doesn't matter, because it's a series of abstractions. That's as close as you're ever going to get to a proper explanation about that crash of images. Huh. In another clip, uh, some, I'll get all this stuff on YouTube, by the way, The Great Educator, right? Democracy in computers. YouTube, it's fantastic. You can learn anything. You can learn how to drive a car. You can learn how to knit. You can learn how to do anything you want on YouTube for free. Brilliant. I know they monetized it, but it's still a great resource. Um, someone else asked him about a particular image, and I forget what it was, but they said, oh, that, that image, it affected me very much. Where did you get that? And he said, oh, I saw it in a dream. He said he saw it in a dream and he liked it, so he, he did whatever had to be done to make it appear in front of the camera. Why not? Of course. Of course. Another person uh, went into a rather detailed analysis of one of his image crashes 
in another movie, Inland Empire, I think, and they said, oh, that's a, that's a metaphor for death. And he just says, no, in a very strong way. And I personally think he said that not because it's not a metaphor for death, but because the idea of nailing it down to anything at all is injurious to the point of making the thing. Because once you say this is about death, then it can't be about anything else. Unless you want it to be. And then you're saying, well, David Lynch said this, you know. He's not God. He's just a guy who makes stuff. So I can tell you what I took from the show. But that might not mean anything to you. And your reasonable response to my ideas could be, well, that's total bullshit, Barry. Yeah? And I will accept that. That's perfectly reasonable. David Lynch himself said, I mean, the clue is in the title. He didn't call it Series 3. He called it Twin Peaks The Return. David Lynch himself has said it's all about the theme of going back. Dale Cooper getting back to Twin Peaks. The name of the little village in the, is called Twin Peaks. Dale Cooper going back to Twin Peaks. Going back, going home. That's the theme. But like all modern art, it's about itself as much as anything else. And if it's about going back, it's also going to be about what it's like to revisit Twin Peaks after all these years. Not just the village, but the TV show which I think is an important part of this. And again, I could be wrong because it's a David Lynch thing. I could be wrong about all this. Please remember, this could all be total bullshit in the sense that I could be wrong, but it is my genuine feelings on the thing. It's not I'm not making it up for lulls. I really think this, but it could all be wrong. But you're stuck with listening to me now if you've switched on this thing and you're in the back seat and you can't reach the dial. So it's not just going to be like what it's like to revisit Twin Peaks The Village and all the little people we knew. It's going to be like what, what it's like for us as viewers to watch something like that. To watch the show Twin Peaks 25 years after the last time. And I kind of I kind of like that, you see. I like all the postmodern self-referential meta stuff. I like it, you know. I um, I keep saying this, but... I'm going to keep saying it because it's important for the context of what I'm talking about. I lived in California for six years. And I thought I was going to be out there forever, but it didn't work out that way. And when I came back in 20... I came back in 2013. And when I came back... All around me are familiar faces, worn out places, etc. You want everything to be just the same as it was. Not want, but you, you almost expect it. You expect everything to be just the same as it was, but it never is. Everything keeps changing, and if you're not around when it happens, then when you come back, it's going to be different, no matter what you do or say. And you'll be different too. Like, why the hell would anyone expect a person or place to just freeze in time until you decide to come back? That doesn't make any sense. We develop a sense of object permanence at a very young age, so let's stick to that, yeah? And on one level, which is the most superficial level, that's what this show is about, if you want to say it's about anything. Like, 90% of the characters are going home, they're going back somewhere, they're, including you, by the way, you're a character in the show, well done, sort of. Uh, including you, if you've seen the original series. Like, there's things that are designed to hit you a certain way, if you've seen the original series, that you'll miss if you haven't. And that's okay. You know, why not? Let's put little Easter eggs, I suppose you call them, would you? If it wasn't a DVD, you'd call them Easter eggs. Little special surprises that pop up when you have the right approach. And I suppose in DVDs, Easter eggs would be approached by hitting the buttons a certain way. But in Twin Peaks, it's having seen the original series is what the approach is. But it's also about a bunch of other stuff. All the good stuff, you know? All the Hamlet stuff. Appearance versus reality. Uh, friendship, good versus evil is a very real concept and good versus evil as a concept that might not mean much of anything uh, personal identity uh, the breakdown of the American dream all American art since World War II is about the breakdown of the American dream and I can prove it using a computer that's a very strong thing I have all proper American art no true Scotsman, yeah I've already landmined my theory but never mind um, all American art just leave it there and let you contradict me is about the breakdown of the American dream and how the American dream is total bullshit for anybody who actually has to live it. And there's a lot of that in Twin Peaks, the show. Um, also, good versus evil, but, you know, what does that mean? 
and the the creation of art, creating things, creating anything, um, all shot through with a consciously old-fashioned 1950s kind of aesthetic design feel, which, let's face it, comes free with every David Lynch thing. Except Dune. Because Dune is set hundreds of years into the future in a different galaxy. So it would be odd if they were going to diners and having slices of cherry pie. Although I'd like to see that movie. Twin Peaks. Dune. No, I wouldn't. That would be just a nightmare. So yeah, that's what it is. Don't expect it to be literal. That's not going to happen. So I guess that's it. That's my defense of Twin Peaks. It's pure art. It's never going to make sense. And instead of asking, what does this represent? Ask, what do I represent? And what does this show... Like, how does this show help in answering that question? What do I represent? That's it. That's my spirited shouty, jokey, sweary defense of Twin Peaks because I, I've no interest in talking about the plot or anything. It's, it's just a complete waste of time. Just watch it if you think if if you're alright with it being a series of abstractions and you're going to approach it in that way you might enjoy it. Um, that's it. If you liked this, please tell your friends. Uh, if you didn't like it, please tell everyone you know and I am out. Not like you